Have you checked the children? <laughs> is Stephen King. I'm gonna scare the hell out of you. Long days and pleasant nights, fellow travelers along the path of the beam. I am known on this level of the towers. Jaime and Fuego, and if it please you, join me here for a bit of palaver on hail to Stephen King. And this is something that I had been planning to do for quite some time because I know that Psy King has had various cameos over the years, and there were many that I have seen and that are well known, you know, Jordy Verrill and Creep Show, and even to It Chapter 2 just a couple of years ago. But there are some of the more obscure, including ones that I was completely unaware, including a Josh Boone film and a little stint on Frasier that was minuscule, absolutely minute, but let's take a look together at all of Cy King's cameos over the years, and he is just celebrating his 40th anniversary of, at least to the best of my knowledge, the first known on-screen uh, little stint for El Rey, as I so affectionately call him. And this is in an obscure George Romero film from 1981. Called Night Riders that stars Ken Foray, Tom Savini, Ed Harris, and it is essentially about a bunch of LARPers that they go and have these large jousting competitions with a number of spectators, and instead of being on horses, they are on motorcycles. Sounds right up Psy King's Alley, obviously, and he has a very amusing little bit here as he is stuffing his face with hoagies and uh, drinking some Budweiser, but even better, we actually get a little bit from uh, Tabby, who is there with him as well. So very cool to see the both of them together and looking oh so young and oh so uh, post, uh, you know, counterculture of the time. It's a very amusing scene, I must say. Then next up from 1982, the following year, when the partnership was solidified with George A. Ramiro, we have the extensive segment of Creepshow known as The Lonesome Death of Jordy Verrill. This is not one that I will focus upon as much because this is widely available to see and yet has a hilariously over-the-top performance from Psy King once again. Remember, this was when he was still on the sauce and, you know, progressively getting a little bit crazier as the 80s went on, and his performance is immensely memorable and obviously tragic as well. Now, in the following year of my birth as well, uh, 1983, we had King deciding to, uh, yeah, reach out to some marketing, do a little bit of advertising, none other than an American Express commercial. Do you know me? It's frightening how many novels of suspense I've written. But still, when I'm not recognized, it just kills me. So instead of saying I wrote Carrie, I carry the American Express card. Without it, isn't life a little scary? To apply for the card, look for an application and take one. The American Express card. Don't leave home without it. He was at the height of his popularity. I believe there were three different books that were all released this year. And as you can tell from this clip, he is most definitely hamming it up. And I would imagine that a little bit of uh, extra kickback from Amex was helpful in uh, you know, making sure that there is uh, lots of powdery substances around for a few years later when he would move on to Maximum Overdrive. That's right, guys. And this is the one that graced the beginning of this segment. And yet it is... It's a cameo for the ages of hilarity, but it's obviously overshadowed by that insane commercial. This machine just called me an asshole. Then the following year in 1987, Psy King returned, but this time in a much smaller role than in the previous creep show. It's just a little cameo as a truck driver in the third and final segment called The Hitchhiker. And uh, he has uh, well, he has some dialogue that uh, he will probably regret years later uh, when he makes a brief appearance on The Chappelle Show. It's like a black guy, huh? What's happening? What do you think's happening? Guy got creamed, that's what happened. 
happens all the time. Rounding out the decade in 1989 with one of the strongest Psy King adaptations, we have his cameo in Mary Lambert's Pet Cemetery, the original and far superior of the two adaptations. And in this particular scene, he is blessing the uh, sad demise of Gage Creed, a name that he would actually take upon himself in another cameo years down the road. The seldom seen Golden Years was released in 1991 based on a novel idea that Psy King had that just apparently never quite gelled, but he decided to retrofit it and move it on to CBS television. And in true King fashion at the time, he makes a cameo in the fifth episode entitled Second Chance as a bus driver. Now granted, this is nowhere near any of the most memorable, but it's just nice to see a familiar face, especially in a series that a lot of people felt did not deliver uh, to the caliber that they had expected from El Rey. I hate these side of the rotors. Huh. They're not like this on the Indiana side, let me tell you. Drive the bus and put your mouth in neutral. How does that sound? Does that yeah, sound okay? Yeah, yeah, you can't talk to me like that. The following year in 1992, it is legitimately shocking that Psy King did not put this film together when he was all, you know, sauced up and, and you know, putting things, you know, down his throat, up his nose, everything else. That uh, 1992's Sleepwalkers as the cemetery caretaker is still one of the more memorable moments of this film because of the fact that you have two other horror legends that show up in the scene with him, most notably Toby Hooper, who had directed, uh, you know, the original Salem's Lot and, uh, you know, various other iconic horror classics. And then the the new guard, so to speak, and a man that he had vouched for significantly in the 1980s, Clive Barker. And we have a nicely cagey and manic little bit. You okay, ma'am? Um, of course I am, why? Well, you were having a bad dream. Must have been a real wowser by the sound. Was it about him? The walking dude. Another scene by a great many, 1994's miniseries of The Stand, directed by Mick Garris, and this is the first time since the original Creep Show that El Rey really gets the chance to get into a role a little bit more than just a cameo. He is playing Teddy, who is a minor character in the book, but he does have a few scenes to shine, including picking up Nadine, as we see here, and then he is at the finale of the film, basically, when we have Stu and uh, M-O-O-N, you know, that spells Tom Cullen, finally making their way back to Boulder after escaping the carnage that was Las Vegas and thankfully not having to be there. So it is one of King's better roles and really shows, you know, a bit of emotion especially in this last scene where there's the revelation of what has happened with Stu and Franny's child. Just a year later, 1995, yes, the King adaptations were still coming, but there were a lot of people starting to criticize the caliber of the quality. However, I will definitely say that this is one of the more memorable Psy King cameos as Tom Holby. Give us your report, Craig. Tell us how much money you made for us because of the fact that he has this great uh, confrontation with Homie from Perfect Strangers, and he, once again, in, in similar fashion to what we see at the beginning of that trailer for Maximum Overdrive, yes, he just dials in to the maniacal, and it's pretty delightful. A cameo that I forgot was a little lengthier than from what I recalled, and that's for Thinner. As the pharmacist. That's right. So Psy King is there and he is talking with our ancient gypsy and his daughter, believe it or not. And uh, yes, he is on hand when the initial death that sets the events into motion actually happens. And I had forgotten that he actually shows up as a witness in the kind of deposition that is going down to see if there are any proper charges that are going to be levied against our slammy Mr. Lawyer Man. You saw the old woman leave the store, Mr. Bangor. She was running. I guess so. They were stealing. Again, King actually bringing it, despite having such a small amount of screen time. 
Then in 97, that's right, he was doing one of these just about every single year at this particular point. And uh, a lot of people have just torn to shreds 1997's uh, Mick Harris adaptation, which Cy King scripted of The Shining, trying to right some of the tonal wrongs, at least, that Al Ray perceived from the Kubrick adaptation that is so beloved. But he did show up as a uh, very heavily make up band leader, rocking a gnarly little, uh, you know, pencil mustache and while a, a very brief little bit on screen, it is definitely one that, that uh, sticks out in my mind and uh, you can tell he's having a lot of fun. Uh, also uh, credited as Gage Creed, as I hinted at just a little bit earlier. 1999 Storm of the Century, so insanely underrated, and uh, I was just rewatching it the other day, and it holds up magnificently. The ensemble is great, and despite clocking in at four hours, it doesn't really feel its runtime. It's one of the strongest uh, you know, television adaptations, not even an adaptation in this particular regard. This was something that King wrote specifically for screen, and he shows up in an incredibly eerie segment that I have tracked down here on a broken TV where he is kind of this sleazy lawyer. And in 2000, we have a double down of voiceover. First off, this very tiny clip that I will show you from Frasier. Roz, who else do we have? We have Brian on a car phone. Huh. Go ahead, Brian. I am listening. For what? 30 seconds? I'll wait, too. <laughs> He was probably a fan of the uh, Kelsey Grammer sitcom and was more than willing to have this funny little uh, anecdote for the call-in radio host. The bigger cameo from this same year came during the 12th season of The Simpsons, and I thought that this clip was actually a little bit longer than it actually is. It clocks in at less than a minute. We're not going to be able to see the entirety of it. But Mr. King, what tale of horror and the macabre are you working on now? Oh, I don't feel like writing horror right now. I'm working on a biography of Benjamin Franklin. He's a fascinating man. He discovered electricity and used it to torture small animals and green mountain men. And that key he tied to the end of a kite, it opened the gates of hell! In true King fashion, he always veers into the supernatural to a slight degree, talking about the uh, key opening up other worlds and, you know, just all kinds of scary, nasty things. And so it is, in true Simpsons fashion, respectful of the character, but also poking fun in the slightest degree. So you have to have thick skin and you have to not take yourself as seriously to cameo as a celebrity on The Simpsons and actually provide your voice. King did make an appearance a number of years later, as you see here uh, in the opening segment, kind of dueling with Bart in the all work, no play, and so on and so forth. Uh, that was for Treehouse of Horror 24 in the opening segment. Rose Red, 2002. Pizza delivery guy, Cy King. You know, everybody's got to eat. And uh, this is not the only uh, little, uh, you know, just featuring of his visage. He also does appear in this fake documentary that I could not track down. One of the few things of this entire list. The most important part is, you know, him showing up in the miniseries proper. But yes, the unlocking Rose Red Diary of Ellen Rimbauer. He apparently uh, shows up as himself in this viral marketing campaign that they had trying to give some sort of legitimacy to this mashup of the Winchester Mansion and uh, obviously, you know, the, the Haunting of Hill House. Then we briefly come to one of the strangest Psyching cameos that I can really recall in all of the entirety of his uh, of his credited work, and that's none other than a 2003 appearance on the Chappelle Show. Chappelle Show, Chappelle Show. That's right. So they were doing a segment at the time called Ask a Black Dude, and it had none other than Paul Mooney. Cy King was writing off of the uh, you know major respect of uh, the Green Mile that had come out recently. But uh, yes, King's inquiry, as you will see here in a moment, is a bit strange, and I do have to cut off. Paul Mooney's uh, just, well, rather harsh response to what uh, Cy King inquired. Black people want to go to black dentists and the black people want to get buried by black undertakers. That's funny. Stephen King. Now we hit the Lars von Trier adaptation. That's right, Cy King. Uh, for whatever reason, while I enjoyed aspects of Kingdom Hospital, I still have found it strange when King has been so compelled to adapt other people's works, but that is exactly what he did for Kingdom Hospital, and he shows up in the finale playing uh, Johnny B. Good, a character that Bruce Davison's doctor is trying to track down this maintenance dude like the entire time to no avail, and this was another clip that was very tough to track down, hence the briefness 
weirdness of it, but he does show up in the finale. And in one of his briefest cameos, we all are aware, if you are any sort of diehard constant reader, that Cy King is an enormous baseball fan, and specifically the Boston Red Sox being a New England native. And so the Fairley brothers put together a film a number of years ago in 2005 called Fever Pitch. It was one of those romantic comedies, but with the sports background setup sort of thing going on. And none other than uh, Jimmy Fallon, who would go on to much bigger things as the Tonight Show host. Still not the biggest fan of his, but uh, Drew Barrymore as well. It's a cute pairing and uh, the reverence for the longtime diehard and long-suffering up until just the year before when they finally broke the curse. Cy King got to throw out the opening pitch in this film, and he, he almost got it. He's getting up there in years. Give the guy a break. And then another that's incredibly tough to track down, Gotham Cafe, which is based on a story from Everything's Eventual. Uh, actually, uh, longtime King collaborator Bev Vincent actually uh, did a uh, job on the script at one particular point. I'm not sure if it was the original attempt or a polish, but this is one that is you cannot track it down anywhere. It was not even shown during the recent Dollar Babies film festival that uh, they did, Stephen King rules. So uh, if it is uh, floating anywhere around on the interwebs and you happen across this video, definitely uh, the horror show 666 at yahoo.com. Give us that chisel. And in another bit that very few are aware of, I would imagine, in the George A. Romero continuing his friendship with him, Diary of the Dead, which was a found footage sort of attempt, and uh, obviously Romero with more social commentary, but there were three different noteworthy names that were featured with these uh, film call voiceovers of the ominous variety. You had Guillermo del Toro, you had Simon Pegg, and none other than Cy King, and I'm very happy to have tracked down the uncut version of Psy King's phone calls, and uh, it is definitely on the creeptastic side. You got a good level and everything. You're all set. Are you sound? Okay. Here comes my Academy Award. We're, we're rolling when you're ready. Okay. And the Lord said, you must pay for sin, and what you will pay is pain and a loss. Can you give me hallelujah? The Lord said, the rock will not hide you. The dead tree will give no shelter. Can you say amen? These are the end of times, and for the sinner there will be no end. Only the death that will not die, and the hunger that will not be satisfied. Get on your knees. Get on your knees. Get on your fucking knees. <laughs> And in what would have been the proper bookend in hindsight to the <laughs> to the fever pitch, it's none other than a hilarious ESPN Sports Center commercial from back in 2008 that Cy King did, where he is essentially helping with the, the story writing process, but injecting a little bit of uh, his standard flavor, as you will see here. For the most part, we write all our own material. Occasionally, we have to bring in a ghostwriter. I like it. It's good. You like it? Yeah, great. Good. That's it, Dan. Uh one thing, and I know Boston beat New York last night, but I think it was more because of the Red Sox clutch hitting than, than New York's lineup, you know, being possessed by the demon. Oh, and no players with telekinetic powers either, please. Once again, appreciate those bearing with some of the audio issues. It is, uh, it's tough when you're trying to track down all of these obscure things that are not readily available, but that one cracks me up every single time. And yet in a total shift of gears, in 2010, and the gears uh, aspect actually is proper for this one, Cy King was a big fan of Sons of Anarchy, and he got to, in 2010, actually be a, a cleaner, a body disposer of sorts. that someone for Amelia Nate. Hey, he's giving her a ride home. And uh, he's a fan of 80s music, and I know that he was such a big fan of this show, which is why, despite not having the most memorable sort of scene or anything of that nature, he plays it stoic, he plays it cool, riding up on his uh, on his hog, and, you know, he's got his shades on, and you could tell he was having a blast, and, uh, yeah, just, uh, I mean, getting the chance to step into a world that you love that much. Here is one of the few from way back in 2012 that... 
I was completely unaware of until I just decided to take a peek at Cy King's IMDb and see what his actor credits were. And lo and behold, there is a voiceover bit from Stuck in Love, which is written and directed by Josh Boone, who has a just long tenured uh, relationship with Cy King. Whereas they were like pen pals when Josh was a kid. And this scene is essentially Nat Wolf living out a fantasy of being contacted by none other than Stephen King and and getting a seal of approval for a story that he has written. Hello? Hello? Is Rusty there? Uh, this is Rusty. Rusty, this is Stephen King. And I have not seen this film, but it does have quite the eclectic cast. Greg Kinnear, Lily Collins, Jennifer Connelly. There's lots of lots of big names in this, so I think I will have to at least give it a shot at some particular point, especially with my affinity for Miser Boone. Rounding out the odds with just a couple more, I reviewed the entire Under the Dome three-season series that just uh, within the last year or so, and King makes an appearance during the premiere of the second season, which he also scripted himself. He's just hanging out in the diner, Angie pours him some coffee. That's about the extent of it. But just seeing him on this show that he has actually backtracked a little bit on and said that he didn't think it was the greatest of adaptations of a book that he actually appreciates a great deal. I not so much, but as I always contend on here, art is subjective, whether it's on the printed page or here on screen, because I know a lot of people did quite enjoy this. In comparison, one of the greatest adaptations that we have had during the last 10 years or so of Psy King is none other than Mr. Mercedes that started out on the AT&T network and then has since shifted over to Peacock TV, which is owned by Universal NBC. And I'm so glad that people are actually getting to see this series proper because King has a gnarly cameo in this in the first season where basically Harry Treadaway is, uh, as, as Brady Hartsfield, just having this little fantasy at this business lunch where he has the chance to get a promotion and really all he wants to do is just inflict carnage and kill numerous peeps around him. This was actually recycled in the third season opening, if I remember correctly. And do you know King always has a super cool time when he gets to be either killed on screen, you know, like in Creep Show, or just be a part of this Carnage candy. In his last major cameo in 2019, many people had some misgivings with It Chapter 2. I personally preferred it, although I didn't absolutely adore this cameo as the shopkeeper. It was incredibly tongue-in-cheek and meta in the regard of uh, you know this character referring to uh, many writers not being able to actually finish a story you know just uh, to strike that landing and so on so yes it is a, a cute one and they even made a pop figure of his character which I own but as far as the most memorable and the upper echelon of seeing King on screen this at least for me was not as well received as it was for others and in our most recent from 2020 CBS All Access the stage and there is an episode where our friends, that's right, uh, you know, Nick and Tom Cullen, M-O-O-N, that spells uh, Nick Andros and Tom Cullen. They have a very amusing, cathartic little bit where Nick happens to see where Hemingford home is, where they have to head, and that's what you were seeing with this jovial response and the camaraderie. One of the few things that uh, you know was good about this miniseries, but I will not to derail it any further. That has been done enough on this channel already. I've been Jaime in Fuego, and you can find me on all social media sectors, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and uh, until the Wheel of Ka comes around once more, hasta luego, sin amigos, constant readers and viewers, in this case, alike, say thank you. Hope we share more palaver sooner rather than later, and until then, stay scared and read Stephen King.